Today is September 29, 2021. My name is Luchana Spraker. I'm the director of the City of Savannah's Municipal Archives. I'm with Pat Monahan, former City of Savannah City Manager. We're sitting in this council chamber in Savannah City Hall today for our interview. Thank you for joining me today, Mr. Monahan. Um, so let's start off with what is your full name? Uh, my full name is Patrick Chang Monahan. Um, do you want to tell us what the, is J initial? No, it's Chang. Chang, okay. C. So I always signed it Patrick C. Monaghan, but uh, I happen to be born in Korea. Oh, okay. So that was actually one of my Yeah, questions. and I was uh, born uh, with an American father and a Korean mother. Was your father um, in the military service? Uh, I was adopted. But my, uh, my adopted father was in the military. He was a highly decorated officer in World War II. So what year were you born? I was born in 1954, which uh, there's a, a strange semblance to 1954 being the first year of the city manager form of government in the city of Savannah. So that's why it's easy for me to say that, yeah, it's uh, 67 years because all I have to do is count my birthday. <laughs> so when did you come with your uh, parents to America? Uh, I was three years old, so that would have been 1957. And. Um, uh, what were your parents' names? Uh, Rosalind and Fred Monahan. Was um, the name changed? Is that from your adopted yep. mother? Yep. Um, so when you came back to America with them, where did you guys settle and where did you grow up? I grew up in a little town called Fort Pierce, Florida, which is on the east coast, uh, about 60 miles north of West Palm Beach or Palm Beach. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a small Florida town. Back then, most of the towns, beachside towns, all of small size. I grew up, it was about 30,000, and today the county is about 400,000. So it, sh it reflects the explosive growth of Florida as well. But when I grew up there, of course, it was uh, a small, just a s small city. Uh, I ran around, <laughs> a lot of fond memories along the river, growing up along the river. Uh, playing baseball, just typical stuff that young kids do. So, uh, but now when I go back, it has totally changed. When I grew up, there was nothing on the beach. There were a few houses scattered on North Beach, but South Beach was, uh, was almost vacant. And now, of course, uh, there are condominiums and hotels and the typical beachfront development that you see in, in the southern part of Florida. But no, I do not enjoy going back. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, when my mother passed away <clears throat> 14 years ago, and my friend said she owned a home there. My brother had his house. My sister had her house. And they said, well, are you going to move back to Port Pierce? I said, no. So uh, my brother and I arranged to give the house to my sister. She took care of my mother during the last couple of years when she suffered from Alzheimer's. And we thought that was an appropriate way to thank her. So, um, so your father's already passed as well? Yes. Yeah, he passed in 1991. What, um, uh, when your parents were still alive and working, what did they do for a living? So he was a hospital administrator, and she was an interior de decorator. And so they did that uh, forever and ever. Did you, um, at what point did you leave Florida? Did you leave for college? Well, I, I went to undergraduate at Stetson University in DeLand. I played baseball there and then uh, graduated and went to, uh, went to University of Florida. And my wife was from the Daytona Beach area. Her family was one of the first 100 families in Daytona Beach. And so uh, I decided to intern there. I interned there and then um, decided to live in that area until I was offered the job as the assistant county manager in 1985. And I was surprised when I talked to her about it, uh, I was surprised that she wanted to move. I just thought she was a, you know, Floridian through and through, uh, fourth generation, but uh, no, we decided to move up here in 1985 and we've never regretted it. All right, well, so before we get to the assistant county manager position, what, what were you studying at Stetson and University of Florida? So at Stetson, uh, my original intent was to become an attorney. And so I studied uh, American studies. It's, uh, it's an interdisciplinary where you know, you take, for example, I, I think I took 16 hours of political science, 16 hours of business, 16 hours of uh, literature, and 16 hours of history. And then uh, you write a senior paper, but I ended up writing my junior paper, my senior paper my junior year, so then I took the, 
the uh, history senior and uh, wrote a senior paper in history as well. So I was well versed in history, political science, but uh, a good part of, of uh, business, finance, and accounting. And then at the University of Florida? So uh, I moved to Gainesville with the intent of starting law school, but you know, of course I'm 21 years old and really thinking about my future and asking myself, do you really want to spend three more years in college? So I took some time off and then uh, decided just out of nowhere, a friend of mine was taking the graduate record exam, the GRE, so I took the GRE and I checked the box, was, was I interested in finding out about other universities. So I got two offers, one from University of Michigan and coincidentally the other from University of Florida for graduate assistantship. So I taught writing labs, that sort of stuff uh, for my graduate assistantship. And then you mentioned you were interning in Daytona, so mm -hmm. was that uh, I actually interned with the Daytona Beach News Journal. All right, so you were, uh, when you came to Savannah, you went straight into the assistant county yes. manager position? Yes. Who so I, I worked in, uh, previously I worked in Volusia County, Florida. So uh, my wife was, we were living in Flagler County, which is the county north of Volusia County, which is the Daytona Beach area and she was teaching at a school in Deland, so her round trip every day was 100 miles. She was driving 50 miles there, 50 miles back. And so I told her, I said, you know, the, probably the most she enjoys teaching. Uh, she, in fact, she has her doctorate in education. So uh, we decided to move back to Deland. And so when I was looking at job opportunities, the county manager advertised for an assistant's position, an assistant two position in his office. He had, he had three or four of them. And so uh, he taught, he was an adjunct professor at Stetson, so I knew him from, from his teaching local government. So I walked in at 4.45, I was the 152nd applicant, <laughs> and I ended up getting the job. So I worked in Volusia County for three years, and then uh, made the transition up here to uh, assistant county manager. Uh, Pat Salerno. So Pat Salerno, uh, 1985 was a pivotal year in Chatham County government's history. Chatham County moved to the council, commission manager form of government in 1985 and Pat Salerno was hired as the first county manager. One of the reasons he hired me was actually three reasons. He wanted me to work on the uh, revisions to the Enabling Act, which is similar to the city of Savannah's charter. It's, it sets up the powers and responsibilities the county manager, county commission, just same as the, the city's charter. He asked me to work on the first FLOST, and he also asked me to work on legislative programs. So that was my first introduction to Chatham County working with him. After 30 months, he left to become the Cab Cobb County manager. And so uh, I served as the acting county manager. I was, at that time, I would think I was 33 years old. And so after a couple months, the commission asked me, the chairman asked me whether I wanted to become the county manager, and I told him no. <laughs> I just, uh, I realized then I was working way too much. I had a young family. Uh, one son was, uh, I don't know, 10 years old. The other was seven years old. And I, I just felt as though I was spending too much time away from my family. Back then I was working 70, 70 to 80 hour weeks. I was younger. And, and truthfully didn't know as much about managing as I, should now of course I knew all the financial aspects I knew the the powers and the responsibilities of the county manager but I really didn't know about time management and I did not learn that until Russ Abel showed up so I told him no the county so Pat Salerno the first county manager left Russ Abel the second county manager arrived and I thought that you know maybe in seven to ten years when that opportunity arose that then I would become a county manager or city manager elsewhere and it just so happened that I, I, I learned so much from him I came to respect him so much as an individual, as a manager, the probably still the best day-to-day -day manager I've ever worked with. Uh, that, you know, we worked together for 25 years. So I ended up retiring and never regretted a moment of it. Uh, I was fine with that. I, I got plenty of other opportunities, unsolicited opportunities uh, from other counties. They would contact ACCG and say, Association County Commissioner of Georgia, and ask if you were to recommend someone to become a county manager, who would you recommend? And, my name came up a lot, but I just, I just wasn't interested in moving. Uh, I, I think I made the right decision. So uh, what year did you retire from county county government? 
Uh, I officially retired December of 2012, but then I had so much unused uh, sick and vacation time that uh, my official date was sometime in April. So I did make, and I arrived in April, so I just, I did make about 28 years. So let's talk about some of the projects that you worked at the county. What would you consider the most challenging project of the county? Uh, no doubt was the development of Hutchinson Island and the design and construction of the convention center. Uh, not only because, and I, I've had this conversation with Brett Bell, because Brett's leadership in the arena has pushed that project along, and, and I've told him many times, I said, Brett, you know, my issues were all environmental because I was, I was, we were on the waterfront, we had federal and state permits, not only in Georgia, but also because of the disposal of, of dredge material in the South Carolina, so not only did I have EPD in Georgia, I had DHEC in South Carolina to deal with, I had four federal agencies I had to deal with. So I said, so instead of uh, neighborhoods like you deal with, I had to deal with, with, uh, with uh, manatees and short nose sturgeon. <laughs> so th th quite a contrast and difference, but there it was, if you remember Hutchinson Island back in those days, uh, it was heavily industrial up until probably um, the early 1980s. In fact, I remember meeting with Henry Moore in his office in the Gamble building and he had his windows open and kaolin flakes were coming in <laughs> from the old kaolin mill. Uh, that all, but Hutchinson Island became abandoned not only as a shipping terminal but also all of its industrial uses. And so uh, it, was, it was essentially a blank slate. And so in negotiating with CSX about the potential location of the convention center there, which the county commission selected that as, as the preferred site, it was a blank slate. Uh, we did have to deal with some issues involving slip one, two, and three, uh, contamination issues, but uh, we got those negotiated. We agreed upon a 25 acre donation. So uh, we took that 25 acres and developed it into the convention center. But of course there are no utilities, there were no roads. Uh, so I also was the project manager for the extension of three utility lines under the Savannah River, got approval from the General Assembly, then uh, obtained all the necessary state and federal permits. And, and, and I know that, and maybe this is a little bit off subject, but I always hear about the, uh, an, the antagonistic uh, relationship between the city and the county. That would, that's just not true. I mean, that, that's in part an urban myth. Uh, I, always got, I always received the ultimate and cooperation from Michael Brown and Chris Morrell. Uh, you know, they helped me, the expansion of the, of the uh, water, of the wastewater treatment plant helped in, and then creating the first permit for, uh, for uh, irrigation uh, over using reuse water on Hutchinson Island to irrigate the golf course. So yeah, there was a lot of cooperation with Michael and Chris both. I, w I would say satisfying because I devoted uh, probably a good six, seven years to it. Uh, when I was not originally the project manager, it was split between three of us. But uh, after the, the, uh, the, the county received the, the guaranteed maximum price, which was about $30 million over budget, so it required this drastic redesign within a short period of time to meet our other requirements. And so it w redesigned. So at that point, the county manager said, well, can you spend more time on it? So I was supposed to spend 20 hours on that and 20 hours on my other responsibilities. It just didn't work out that way. Uh, for about six months, I was in Atlanta every other week for the week, going through the design, going through a lot of the construction issues, trying to reduce the cost. Uh, so finally, we did get the project back into budget. So yeah, those were so difficult and challenging times, the, the word you like to use. So those are def def definitely challenging times. But we worked through it, and uh, I find rewarding the fact that, that uh, the state's accepting the responsibility for the $260 million expansion and the second phase tells me it was well worth it. And, I, and, I've, and I've told Brett that on a number of occasions, too. I said, Brett, 20 years from now, uh, you'll look back and you'll forget about a lot of the, the difficult times, the sleepless nights, uh, just just questioning your sanity at times, uh, not making friends because you've got to take the tough, make the tough decisions at times, the tough recommendations and the tough decisions. But you'll look back and 
you know, you'll be able to show your son and your family, yeah, I did that. So, uh, so out of nowhere in, uh, I guess it was around November of 2012, I get a call from this gentleman. He, he, tells, me his, he tells me his name uh, is uh, Carter. And he was developing, he had an idea for a project. It was the Outlet Mall of Georgia, uh, it located in Pooler. And so uh, I had not thought about being a consultant at that time, but uh, he, so I talked to him and he said, you know, I just learned more from you. I told him there were seven, di seven different alternatives I could think of off the top of my head. He needed to provide for about $20 million in infrastructure. So I gave him some ideas. He said, you know, I just learned more in 10 minutes from you than I've learned from all my consultants in the last couple of years. I want to hire you. And I said, well, I'm still obligated to the county. Uh, I had originally planned to retire when I was 55. I was 58 at that time. The county manager asked me to stay on for a few more years to finish what is now called the Pete Lacacus Government Center on Oglethorpe. And so I, um, so I told him, no, I'm obligated here. And uh, he said, well, how about if I, if I just get you to run the numbers on the weekends? So I said, that's fine, I'll do that. So, uh, but I told him I couldn't sign a contract until I left the county, which was some time uh, the first part of January 2013. So I did a lot of work for him, didn't charge him anything until we got to 2013. Now under the county's enabling act, in, in order for me to take on any work, even as a, on a pro bono basis, I need to talk to the county manager. So, you know, Russ Abel and I had developed a, a close friendship. And so I walked into Russ's office and I told him what was going on. I said, I, I can just run the numbers. They're just spreadsheets. I'll do them on the weekends. And he says, what happens if I said no? And I said, I guess I leave right now. <laughs> so we laughed about it. And so when I retired, officially left the county and could uh, work as a consultant, I started my own consulting company, Governomics LLC. And before you know it, I picked up three clients. And so for the first, uh, after I retired, that's why I say I'd, I've actually retired. I'm in my third retirement. So my first retirement, I left the county. I started Governomics. But then uh, later that summer, I got a call from some friends of mine who said, uh, we'd, at, we'd, at, we'd like you to take a look at the books at Union Mission. And so I reviewed their financials and I called them back and I said, uh, gentlemen, you got a, and ladies, I, I said, you got a problem. I said, you're, uh, you're probably uh, somewhere around $2 million out of balance financially. And so uh, I met with them and, and talked to them. And so, of course, they offered me a position. I said, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you my three conditions. I said, one, I will become your executive director, but with the understanding I only, can only work 20 or 30 hours a week because I've, I've got three clients and they're my first obligation. Uh, second, uh, I'm only going to do this for a short period of time. And third, I've got to work pro bono. And they thought that was, I had all these magnanimous reasons for wanting to work pro bono, but the fact was, I didn't want to take calls from clients if I'm working for Union Mission. Uh, at that point, I, I mean, I really didn't need the money. Uh, you know, I have, uh, I'm still the highest pensioner in the county system. <laughs> and I was doing extremely well consulting. So no, I, I would not accept any money for it. And in fact, I said, I want to pick up all my own expenses. I had to travel to meet with DCA a couple times. So I said, I'll just pay for those out of my own pocket my own office supplies because I had my consulting business to fall back on. So I did that for 10 months. And then uh, I went back to consulting, continued on a couple other projects. While I was with the county, I completed $350 million in capital projects in my career. And so while I was working as a consultant, I created, just loosely, I created the opportunity for about uh, 4,000 new jobs because that's what I focused on and uh, created about $600 million in new investment in the community in my seven and a half years. So I received a call from, from uh, if I can move on, if I received a call from uh, Mayor Deloach. And he, he actually had called me a couple times. He called me, said, you know, we're having problems with the arena. Uh, I'd like you to become a consultant with the city. And I said, well, I would need to talk to the city manager. Uh, I'm, I'm very respectful of that delineation and responsibilities between the council and their legislative responsibilities and the city or county manager being responsible for the day-to-day -day organization. And he says, well, I, he said, and I said, and the other is I'm, I'm working as a consultant. I don't really know that I have the time. I don't want to take on more than three consultants. 
because I promised my wife I would not work more than 20 hours a week, which I admit I violated that on a number of occasions. Uh, so I, uh, so I said, no, I'm not interested in doing that. He, he asked me about helping because I helped the county resolve 300 delinquent property issues. I put those back on the tax rolls while I worked for the county. That was one of my projects. And so uh, he called me up. He said, well, would you come take a look at some of our property issues? I said, Mr. Mayor, I, you, you've got you, you've to find staff at the city. You need to get the, the city staff to take a look. I, I don't need to do that as a consultant. So uh, Mayor Deloach called me the third time. And I, so I, <laughs> I have this picture that's actually it's my screensaver. I'm in my hammock in, uh, on our deck in North Carolina. We have a second home there. And so uh, I could hear, I, I could actually hear some distress in his voice, whereas the other times he was just kind of feeling me out. This time he said, uh, he said the, the city manager, Robert Hernandez, just left my office. He's giving notice, he's leaving. He said, so my first question, I said, you must have someone within the organization. And he said, I don't think so. So I said, well, let me talk to my wife and if she's okay with it. And so I talked to her and I talked to, uh, some of my clients, uh, particularly CETA, Trip Tollison's the president and CEO, and so he was one. Of, uh, CETA was one of my major clients, and so I told him I would that if I left, I wasn't going to come back. So, and he was 100% uh, for me assuming the position. So I told. So in my follow-up with Mayor Deloach, I asked him, I, know, I said, now how's council feel about this? Because you got an election coming up. I said I don't want to be a disruption to council, and he said that uh, council was unanimous. And that, uh, and they wanted me. So, I told them I would have to be on a limited schedule. I said, let's say just let's say ten months. Although I signed a contract for twelve months, not knowing, and so I became the city manager. Now, what, what's strange about the city manager? Because I've been referred to as the acting city manager, interim city manager. If you go by the charter, there is no such thing as an interim city manager. You're either the city manager, or you're not, unless you're an acting. Now, in the acting capacity, that's uh, basically you've got 90 days and then council has to, has to uh, revise that every 90 days to reappoint you as the acting city manager. So I was, uh, I was even though I was there on interim time, I was named the city manager. And I was surprised when I walked into the organization because as I mentioned previously, I, I worked closely with Michael and Chris Morell, uh, Michael Brown and Chris Morell. Stephanie Cutter a little bit, just, but from time to time, and more cooperative than anything else. Uh, never worked that much with Rochelle Small Tony, uh, who followed. Uh, did not work at all with Rob Hernandez. Uh, didn't even know Rob Hernandez. In fact, a couple times on CETA's behalf, I need to make. I made presentations to City Council about Freeport, and uh, and so when I I sent an email to Rob Hernandez just as a courtesy, asking to be placed on the agenda on behalf of CETA. And both times he put me last on the agenda, so <laughs> I, I didn't necessarily have good thoughts about him because because one time you know the city council meeting lasted four hours and I had to sit for four hours until I got up to speak and that took all of 45 seconds, <laughs> but uh, because I had made a presentation in the workshop. Anyway, uh, so I so I didn't really know anyone at the city. I walked in and the first thing that struck me is, oh my gosh. They're all kids. They're like 40 years old. <laughs> I mean, most of the leadership of the city is quite young still. I, I think which, uh, which speaks well of the future of the city and the stability of the city, but the city has gone through some tough, tough. So I made presentations about what I wanted to accomplish in my 10 months. Uh, and so the, the, the big three was one, getting the, making sure the budget was adopted, getting the SPLOS vote approved. That was SPLOS 9. That, uh, that vote occurred in the fall of of 2019, and then uh, and then and, and then just to bring some stability to the organization. I mean, I was the fourth city manager in eight years. When you look upon that wall, I mean, you have two city managers and Don Mendonza and Michael Brown, who had served the city for 44 years. Almost just 44 out of 67 was that. Almost two thirds of the of the time of the council manager form of government, two of them brought a lot of stability to the organization. And then suddenly to see the, the turnstiles after that, that, even though I don't live in the city, I, I feel as though the city's the economic driver for the community and what happens at the city reflects what happens in all of the county. And as I said, I, I always, when I worked with Michael and Chris, I always would ask, you know, if they asked me something, I said, well, 
I'll, I'll think about it, but always in consideration, what's in the best interest of the community? I mean, the city and the county. Uh, I can think of a number of projects where I helped out Michael the, and, and Chris, the, the first tax allocation district, East River Landing, which we used to call Savannah River Landing, but it's the East Savannah Tax Allocation District. I worked with them closely on that, on a number of other issues, purchase of the Comcast building, uh, just as I said, just a number of other issues where Michael and Chris and I worked closely together. So I was always, I was always uh, thinking in the best terms of what's best for the community. And I think Michael and Chris felt that way too. Uh, I, I've, we seldom, now Michael and, and Russ Abel didn't always get along, but, uh, and then Michael would come to me and I would go talk to Russ and I would, I won't say present the city's case, but I would tell him I'm here because Michael Brown called me and, and here's what he's thinking. And Russ would generally concur as well. So, uh, so it was a new organization for me, um, uh, just up and down, I, I, I very, I knew very, very, very few in the organization, but I did want to bring some stability to it. And as you can tell, I, I tend to be a relaxed person. I don't, you know, I don't jump up and down. I don't scream. I don't lose my temper, at least very often. Uh, so I think I, I brought that to the organization, gave them very specific things I'd like to see accomplished within the first 10 months, and we accomplished most of them. Uh, both not only externally, but also internally. I, you may not recall, but there were six vacancies in IT. You know, uh, Rob Hernandez, the former city manager, had uh, promoted this idea of outsourcing IT. So I had to meet with the IT folks saying, that's not gonna happen on my, wa my watch. Uh, so, I, so we need to fill those positions. Also in purchasing, we had an acting purchasing director, but we had a number of vacancies in purchasing as well. The agenda process was just, you know, I went from from an agenda process at the county that was streamlined. Uh, we met on uh, Friday, we published the agenda on Tuesday, uh, and then we met on Friday. So it was a very streamlined process and I wanted to replicate that at the city, which I, th I think uh, we were successful in doing that. But also in looking at, I presented what the, a SWOT analysis to the city staff, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, <clears throat> which I talked about where it, from an outsider's point of view, you know, I'm not going to make major changes. Re Rob Hernandez reorganized the organization. I wasn't going to go back and, and put, my, put my point of view on it for, you know, for my short time. And of course, as we know, as, as looking back, my 10 months became 18 months. So it was nine months with the council that hired me initially, uh, but also the next council had to extend my contract. As I mentioned, it was only for 12 months. And I, so I just did it month to month. And I put in the contract because I even was questioned about it. Well, you know, what happens if you don't like your work? I said, if you read my contract, you give me three days notice. And I said, the only reason I need three days notice is to pack up my stuff. Uh, if you're not comfortable with what I'm, I'm doing as managing this city, as the chief executive officer of the city, or the direction we're headed, then just let me know. I said, I'm here because I want to be here to help the community. I'm not here, you know, I don't, Truthfully, like I said, I didn't need the money. I could go back to consulting, uh, but the others I was looking forward to retirement. So, uh, as I said, my nine months with the prior council, then nine months with uh, the new council, and so 18 months almost to the day. So, um, so you worked with um, two different mayors then. So yes. Was Eddie and then yes, and then Van Johnson. So the unusual part of working with uh, Mayor Johnson I, uh, of course, he worked for the county. So he and I worked together for 25 years. In fact, I remember the first time I saw him, he was, uh, he was hired as an intern. He went from law enforcement, but he was interested in human resources. Uh, county uh, had a wonderful, employed a wonderful human resources director, Beverly Whitehead, who passed away way too young. And she was, uh, and Mayor Johnson, well, Van Johnson then, was her protege. And so that's how the first time I met. Now, he says that it's comforting to know that I went from being his boss and now he's, he was my boss, but not exactly. He was the assistant human resources director. So he was, we interacted on some occasions, but not that often. I was more interactive with his department head or uh, mainly his department head or the assistant city manager who later uh, took over uh, dual responsibilities in the organization. When I was the assistant county manager, when Russ Abel showed up, we had three assistant 
county managers. And I guess it may be disheartening to some, but in a, the first meeting with the county manager, he says, I don't like a three, man, three assistant system. I said, I, he said, I'm going to, we're going to get down to two. So I guess that's one way of giving notice. Well, it was fortunate one of the assistant county managers about six months later decided to get married and she moved to Oregon. So that left two of us. And then uh, he decided uh, he just wanted one. And so he didn't let us know which one, but uh, so then I was the only assistant probably for 20 years. Uh, so I call myself the senior assistant because I was the only assistant. <laughs> and then, uh, and then after I left, he decided uh, to go back to two assistants because he was concerned about a succession plan at the, at the county. Just as he knew, he realized he'd been there as long as he had, and he was thinking about the future of the organization. When he was hired and I was hired in 1985, he came on in 1988, uh, between the two of us, we hired every department head. It was part of that restructuring under the commission manager form of government. So we hired, and so all of us stayed together. So when, unfortunately, when you hire an organization at the same time, they all tend to retire about the same time. So he was a little bit concerned about the succession plan at the county. Something the city needs to be thinking about as well. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. So, ha you know, having spent 18 months with the city and kind of seeing some of the turmoil that the city's gone through in the past few years, what do you see as some of the challenges that we have moving forward? Oh, uh, well, so it's interesting. I met with the new city manager, Jay Melder, and, and I told him one of the documents, in fact, I have it here, uh, that I was going to scan and give to him. I, uh, I consider myself a student of government. I mean, I, I read things that most people don't read. In my collection, I have the uh, 1947 uh, merger of Milton County and Fulton County, <laughs> that consolidation study. I have all the city of Savannah's consolidation studies from, the, from 1968 all the way uh, t to current, well, to the last time in which Chris Morell and I staffed the uh, Consolidation Committee. Uh, so, I ha so I consider myself a, a student of, uh, of government. So in 1986, Don Mendonca presented his State of the City, it's uh, about a 120 page uh, uh, book that he presented to City Council. Well, I have that in my collection. So I told Jay, uh, excuse me, the city manager, that I was going to make him a copy of it. So I scanned it for him to take a look at because I think it's a good reference point. When you take a look, a friend of mine says that the city of Savannah is, or Chatham County and the city of Savannah are the most studied, <laughs> studied governments in the entire United States because we do all these studies. And you know, some come to fruition and some don't. But uh, I look back at that 1986 plan and then the Vision, 20, the Vision 2000 plan. I think those are important that if uh, the city manager wants to, to take a look at what the plans were back in 1986 for the future of the community and 2020, uh, the plans for the future of the community, uh, those are excellent reference points. Not many communities can provide that, that sort of background that provides such a, uh, a, 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 not only synopsis, but a summary of all the major issues. And as much as I hate to say it, a lot of those issues are still lingering. If you go back to the Vision 2000 plan uh, and take a look at what the community identified through the committee structure of neighborhood groups and the virtual town hall, uh, and you take a look at the top 10 issues, those issues are still with us. Poverty, affordable housing. Now, what's interesting, the one issue that we did resolve is air quality. That was number four on the list. And you, I don't know if you remember this, but when I came here, the, the domination of sulfuric dioxide, that odor sulfurous dioxide, principally from the two large paper plants. When I came in 1985, Union Camp employed 4,500. Today it's about 700. So it shows you the changes in the technology. But, but with that, Union Camp, through the, the county created the Air Quality Task Force. The Air Quality Task Force came up, came up with certain recommendations to prove the air quality. And one of those was considered was, uh, was standards for, for noxious odors, uh, not, just, uh, not just the odors that were regulated by EPD and, EP, and the federal EPA, but those related to the stink factor, you know, the smell of the air the, and the, the quality of the air that wasn't being regulated. And what happened, I think a lot of the industries took notice and they decided on their own accord to make the changes. Uh, Union Camp 
uh, invested in a $90 million upgrade of additional scrubbers. And yes, on occasion you do smell the sulfurous dioxide, but when I came to the community, you smelled it, particularly if there was uh, a low ceiling because of, of air pressure, you, you smelled it every day for weeks at a time. And it got on your clothes, and I think, you know, I, and I know people reflect upon uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil and what it did and, and taking a look at uh, Paula Deen's influence on the, on the community and tourism, but I think the improvement of the air quality, which was, as I said, the number four recommendation of the Vision 2000, the, the improvement of the air quality has uh, tremendously influenced the, the growth of tourism over the last many years. And it, we forget about that. But the rest of them, the looking at the recreational needs, the housing needs, the poverty, the need for uh, the better, more jobs and better paying jobs, I think those, uh, th those are all issues that are lingering. I think the community's made major improvements in transportation, the restructuring of CAT, even though CAT's gone through its issues. Uh, that was done by the county in 1985 and 1986 through the restructuring of the transit. Uh, before it was the city of Savannah that managed it. Uh, the county wanted to go to a more regional system. So they were restructuring that transportation and also roads. Uh, because of the special purpose local option sales tax which began in 1985, the, the county has, the county and the municipalities have paid more roads in the last 30 years than in, than in the prior 50 years. Of course, paved roads, that's, uh, that's, you know, didn't become commonplace until after World War II, but the, the county's laid more, the county and the states has laid more, have laid more asphalt than in the prior 50 years of this community. And I think that's made, you know, we, we've sometimes take it for granted. When I moved in 1985, Islands Expressway was a two-lane road with an old dilapidated bridge. It got replaced and now it's being replaced again by a, a high-rise uh, high bridge. Uh, but uh, Truman Parkway, $250 million road project. If not for the special purpose local office sales tax, none of that would have happened. I mean, I, I could spend hours and hours talking about the, uh, the impact of uh, SPLOST, we call it SPLOST, on the community. Well, as I said, my, I originally told council that I would stay until a new city manager was hired, thinking that that process. Now, of course, in the middle of it, uh, COVID hit, and I wasn't going to leave the, the city in the middle of COVID. Uh, you know, even though I was concerned about my own health, I'm not as young as I look, and the health of my family, I was not going to leave the city uh, during COVID. So I needed to make sure that that COVID was, uh, that there was a plan for COVID and dealing with COVID, and I, I think most of that was implemented. But the other is, uh, and I don't want to talk too much about it, but I had a health issue that, that was lingering. The doctor told me I needed to have surgery, and I kept delaying it, delaying it. When uh, Mayor Johnson talked to me about staying another six months to help get through the budget, I talked to him about it. He said, you got to get it done now. And I, so, I, so at that point, I decided you know, and the other is when I talked to the mayor the second time about it, he told me that he had talked to Michael Brown, and I felt as though that, uh, that Michael Brown's prior experience as city manager, his knowledge of the organization, his knowledge of the charter, his knowledge of uh, his love of the community would uh, then allow for a smooth transition. So when, I, especially when I heard that Michael Brown would be coming back, I, I felt more at ease that I did not feel as though I was abandoning the city despite my own personal issues, but uh, I knew that Michael would had a grasp of the organization and the direction the, the city needed to take. So just for the record, what was the actual time span that you were city manager? Uh, I was city manager from June 1st, 2019. Although I had, had planned to leave till the end of October, uh, my agreement said I needed to give 30 days notice. And when I counted the 30 days, I said, uh-oh, I actually have to be there November through November 2nd. So I came and worked those two days, and then uh, Michael Brown showed up November the 3rd. Of yeah. Okay. So, um, and then just a final question about your time as city manager. What would you say was the most rewarding um, aspect of serving as city manager? 
You know, and I, I, I could talk about that, you know, during my time, uh, the city continued on $240 million worth of capital projects. The fact that we adopted one budget, uh, the budget while I was here, uh, adopting the rollback rate, actually two. Uh, the second one was uh, on the path to adopt the rollback rate, but I think the city adopted the uh, current millage rate instead. But uh, rather than talk about the, the continuing financial strength of the city, I, I think just providing that, that, uh, that smooth transition that I didn't come in and make broad sweeping changes again, you know, that I wasn't another city manager that was here to make changes swiftly. Uh, you know, I reassured the staff that I was going to uh, continue uh, with the, the current momentum under the Savannah Forward program. Uh, that I would continue uh, bolstering the financial strength of the community, that I would look for new revenue sources. Uh, everyone, the new council clamored, well, we need, re we need new revenue to fund these programs, these ambitious programs that we want to become more neighborhood-centric in our outlook. And I, while I don't disagree with that, finding the revenue sources can be a difficult task. So I implemented the first, uh, the, uh, we, the city annexed waste management and everybody thought that I was crazy. Why would you want to annex a landfill? Well, the landfill, you know, gets a $2.50 per ton. So there's a, an opportunity for another $2 million in city revenues. We, uh, I looked, when I was approached by the Savannah Economic Development Authority and the developers of Rockingham Farms, I looked at it as an opportunity. That's, that's going to present uh, an, uh, somewhere around eight million dollars a year in new revenue after the the tenth warehouse gets built. I mean those are the type of revenue sources that I think the city needs to take a look at creatively and I think I brought that back into the not, not taking anything away from David Maxwell you know one of the best and brightest he is cut from the same cloth as Dick Evans uh, one of the best and brightest around knows how to do those calculations but sometimes you have to think creatively out of that and even David, I talked to him a couple weeks ago, he called me with the question about Rockingham Farms. I said, yeah, the agreement says that they've got to pay, uh, starting in year three, when the city starts its debt service payments, they've got to pay that debt service whether the, those warehouses are built or not. I mean, that's in the contract. So I think though, that type of uh, thinking, that creativity, and not that the city didn't have that already. I, I, as I said, I think the city's got some of the best and brightest in public service that I've known in, in my 35 years. Uh, far cry from Volusia County where the average manager was probably in 60s. <laughs> uh, as I said, they, they were in their 40s here. So I, I think just providing that smooth transition and just allowing the organization to heal a bit in, until the, a new manager arrived and and fortunately that Michael Brown was there to pick up when I left off and and I think I'm very optimistic about the new city manager I've gotten a chance to meet with him I've prepared some background information for him that I think will help him in the long run but just reading in the paper and I depend upon the paper although I still talk to some city staff from time to time I come to lunch once a week with my lunch crowd and I'll bump into city staff and they're very enthusiastic about him so I'm uh, I, I see good years ahead for the city. And, and I think he'll be a good problem solver. And that's what the community needs, not just a problem solver for the organization, but a lot of the problems of the community are community problems. And you need a, you need a problem solver who knows how to tackle those and address those. And I think he'll, and I think he'll shine in those areas. Uh, you know, and, and I could talk about, I think the, the most, if, if you ask most outsiders and my friends from Florida who have come to visit us, just the, 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 the original principles of the Oglethorpe plan and how, the, how those have been extend, expanded, uh, I, I, I think that's still, Savannah's known for its, I think is known for its, uh, for the, the town plan, I'll call it the town plan rather than the Oglethorpe plan. Uh, even though it's, you know, it, it breaks my heart. I mean, I hear this about the renaming of the squares and some of the other issues. Everyone forgets. I, I think that there's this, and I, and I read uh, Tom Barton's column in the, the paper about the Tomachichi uh, memorial at going back to Wright Square. I think if there's any square that needs to be renamed, it's Wright Square. 
You know, Oglethorpe himself named that Percival Square after his good friend who served on the trustees with him. I, if anything, and James Wright was the last royal governor. I mean, he supported Britain's continued rule o over America. And why, and I understand this whole idea about the, the lessons that we learned from history, but uh, if anything, I think that should go back to Percival Square. But yes, I do love the history, and I think the town plan is, is, still, pro is still probably the most dominant aspect of what makes Savannah unique. Uh, I mean, just those, uh, the 22 squares, I mean, there's some semblance of the other two squares, but mainly in name, I think the city has an opportunity taking a look at Albert Square, and I would, uh, I would applaud the city for doing, uh, uh, proceeding with uh, the, the re I don't want to call it the recreation because that's not a good word, but the, but the rediscovery of the Albert Square intent just as the city rediscovered uh, some of the other squares, including, including the uh, where the old parking garage used to be. Uh, the other, the other, I, I don't know if that makes uh, Savannah unique, but I see Savannah. If you take a look at the trends, we, we're becoming a lot more neighborhood centric. You know, I think of larger municipalities and how they've gone more to neighborhoods. And we take a look at New York with the boroughs and the influence of the boroughs on politics. I, I see that as a trend now. Uh, more involvement in neighborhoods. Uh, in my opinion, sometimes great and sometimes not so great, but uh, I think just becoming more recognizing the history of some of the neighborhoods and respecting that history and building upon that, uh, you know, it's the, the, the residential fabric still, the, that, that's this, the cloth that keeps this community, and, and I, I see that as a favorable trend as well. Oh, let me see. So I can talk about history for a while. I did, as I'm cleaning out my county stuff, it's been eight years, but as I said, I really haven't retired. I did retire from the county and I technically retired from the city. So now I'm in my third retirement. I'm just now cleaning out a lot. I took four boxes of stuff from the county that I had collected, my personal collections. I collected postcards. I gave a bunch of those to, uh, to one of our aldermen who loves postcards, but he told me he gave them to George Historical Society because that, we have an archives here. I know, <laughs> but, but he promised me that once I gave those to him that he would give them George Historical I collected a lot about the history of Hutchinson Island. We forget about Hutchinson Island in 1895. I have an article from Leslie's Weekly, which was like the look magazine of its time that was in November of 1899 and talks about the Four City, which is the city of Savannah. And, and all the, the plans for Hutchinson Island. And there were these uh, supposed to be five slips and seven rail lines. As it turned out, there were three rail lines, and, or five rail lines and three slips. Uh, but the city of Savannah was instrumental in that development. You know, advertised in, in Northeastern papers about come to Savannah and help develop because after, uh, you know, after the, the, the Civil War and the reclamation of the Savannah River. I have some of the original maps from the Corps of Engineers of the Savannah River. I have a map that's, that shows the Savannah River in, what year is that, 1820, 1820s. And what's amazing, when Oglethorpe first discovered, or first set up the settlement of Savannah, he preferred the Ogeechee River, but he said it was naturally wider and deeper. But the reason he settled Savannah was because of the bluff and the ability to provide a defense. But if you take a look at some of those old maps, when Oglethorpe got here, the Savannah River was nine feet deep at low tide. There was, uh, it was called the Garden Bank Shoal, which is approximately where the Marriott's located now. It was four feet deep at low tide. and became a hindrance, and that was because of the Fig Island Cut that separated Hutchinson Island from Fig Island. At one time, Hutchinson Island was three islands, Marsh Island, Hutchinson Island, Fig Island. But through the years, every, the engineers realized that the reason that we were getting the, the Savannah River continued to collect sediment was because of the Fig Island Cut. So there was a period around 1905, between 1900 and 1905, Savannah was hit with three major hurricanes, all category ones as we call them, but caused a lot of damage to the ships. And so they were actually shoved into the bank of what we call Parcel 5 on Hutchinson Island. And so as part of the work that I did at Slip 1 for the county, I had to do an archeological study. So I hired Gordon Watts from uh, Tide Atlantic. And so I was interviewing three marine archeologists. Gordon was one of those. I know I'm getting off subject, but this, this is fun stuff. 
So Gordon was one of those, and so I was going to do reference checks, and I happened to be watching the Discovery Channel that night, and there was Gordon diving off the coast of France on the C for the CSS Alabama. And I thought, that's all the reference I need. So I, I hired Gordon Watts and his company, and he did uh, an archaeological study on what we call the Fig Island derelict, which is about uh, 30 feet exposed in the Savannah River and about 50 feet, uh, probably seven to eight feet under Hutchinson Island. Then he dug up, he dug up the Afton, which is part of the, the Savannah River. He told me it was a uh, he's a fascinating guy. He told me it was a uh, a ship that transported lumber between Savannah and the West Indies. And I said, Gordon, how do you know that? And so he says, you have to get in the water and feel these. And so he said, you feel those holes? I said, yeah. He said, those are nails that, uh, that in, when ships would go between Savannah and the West Indies, they would put on the sacrificial lumber because there is this worm indigenous to the West Indies. The worm would get in the, the sacrificial lumber and then they would remove it. And he said, that's where the holes come from. So that was interesting. He said, yeah, it was 80 foot plus. It was the length that would that carry lumber to the West Indies. But he told me it was the finest collection of 20th century and 19th century vessels in the entire world. So there's a lot of work to be done on the exploration. Now, uh, kudos to the developers of Parcel 5, which will be, they already started on the marina development, uh, condominiums and apartments. They are going to leave that intact. They're not going to bulkhead it and, and create a disturbance to this vessel. So there's an opportunity someday to do further explanation. But that just shows you just, you know, we drive by Hutchinson Island. We see Hutchinson Island with the convention center, with the, with the Westin and the golf course. And, of course, the, uh, the development on the, the residential development on the backside. There are now plans for the Parcel 5 development with the Marina Village. So Hutchinson Island will go through this transformation. We drive by it all the time. We forget about that history. And Savannah's rich in that very type of history. We walk by blocks that, you know, we forget about. You know, it's, I, I kind of laugh because uh, we, we hold Trustee's Garden in such reverence. Well, Trustee's Garden only lasted 10 years, and it was a dismal failure. It was supposed to introduce all these new species into the, to be grown in Georgia, to be exported back to England. It, no. You know, silk for a while, maybe, but uh, mulberry, you know, but not, nothing really significant. But we still talk about it in such reverent terms. You know, but, but, so I, that's what I love about Savannah. It's just, there's this, I have a, a 1910 uh, pamphlet, mar it was a tourism marketing pamphlet, the Ocean Company of Steamship, o Steamship Ocean Company, which uh, was actually where the Georgia Ports Authority is located now. At one time, it, it sailed five vessels a week to New York and three vessels a week to Boston. And so it has this uh, marketing brochure, it's, and it's, it's called Savannah Quirky. So I had to laugh the other day because I saw a convention business bureau, uh, they used in one of their marketing materials, Quirky. Now, I don't know if they got it from that, uh, that old pamphlet or not, but yeah, it, so I, I, did this, uh, I did this PowerPoint, uh, you know, and I have to bring some of those to you. I have, in fact, I, was, I meant to bring, I did a history of the old courthouse, but I had to do this old PowerPoint plant that's this old PowerPoint that's called the more things change the more they remain the same and it talks about when Savannah was looking at uh, steamship or looking at looking at cruise ships we had we were the we were the dominant cruise ship industry for you know back starting with the Central Georgia Railroad from about 1890 the reason uh, the, uh, the, the, the the railroad was built the Tybee Railroad was built to Tybee Island uh, with the depot down at the foot of uh, General McIntosh, we forget about all that. The, the, re the resurrection of the trolleys, yeah, Savannah had, has one of the oldest trolley systems in the United States. So we think about we're creating all this new stuff. Drainage, I have some of the original drainage plans. When I was at the county, we were cleaning up the old courthouse. I came across these plans, probably six sets of them. They're, they're probably four feet wide and 20 feet long. They map out the entire drainage of the county. You know, Springfield Canal, uh, the Harden Canal, Casey Canal. We think about all the, the, the technology that we use. I mean, they, they created these maps. Now, I, I gave them to, uh, to our GIS specialists who took them to Clayton State and got them all reproduced, so they're available. 
but we think we're so sophisticated in this day and age. The fact that they surveyed so much of this community and got the elevations, you know, there's a reason the Casey Canal is located where it is. There's a reason the Springfield Canal is located, the Harden Canal, all of those. There, there's a reason for every single one of them. Land yeah. Those yeah. So yeah, I'm still, uh, as you noted, I'm. Uh, I, I love Savannah history. I, I grew, as I said, I grew up in Florida. I didn't know a lot about Savannah history, but when I realized the importance of history, not only to Savannah, to the state of Georgia, I just, I just read everything I could. A friend of mine wrote an eighth grade textbook, and he sent it to me in 1985 on uh, on Georgia's history, and so uh, I just continued to read. And then when I was at the county, uh, every day for lunch, I didn't go day after day, but uh, every day during lunch, I would go to a different square and I read every historical marker in that square. So I have read every historical marker. And I even had some questions about some of them because I know they don't have bronze out. But if you go to the Oglethorpe marker and you would think that Savannah would get this right above any other, but it says he was of counsel to the colony but it spells council, C-O-N-C-I-L, <laughs> instead of C-O-U-N-S-E-L. But uh, yeah, I even on uh, the Spanish American, I thought they misspelled Puerto Rico, but my wife who's, uh, who has uh, undergraduate degrees and, ma and a master's in Spanish and a doctorate, and she told me, no, that's, that was just uh, back in, in the, after the Spanish American War, that's the way they, they it was not unusual to spell it that way, because it's like Puerto Rico instead of Puerto Rico, anyway. Something new yep, and, and, I, and, you know, and this isn't necessarily advertising, but I love the stuff you send me. You put me on your mailing list. I read all of that. Uh, I, even, uh, I even looked at some of the YouTubes, some of the rather lengthy YouTubes uh, about snapshots in time of Savannah's history. So, yeah, I enjoy those. So, thank you. Well, well we thank you for sharing your history. <laughs> your experiences and, and the people you work with over yeah. time as well. And, and their yeah, I, I didn't start mentioning a lot of the people and I, I won't mention a lot of the people individually because once I get started, I don't think I can stop. But as I said, Savannah has some of the best and brightest I've ever worked with. Uh, I see a lot of potential here. I mean, not only the capability, but the potential to grow even more and become better managers. I, I definitely see that in this organization. And I, knew, and I know the new city manager will as well. Uh, so yeah, I'm... Uh, I was thankful for my time. It's um, when both uh, Mayor Johnson and, and Mayor Deloach spoke at my portrait hanging. Uh, you know, they both both agreed that I was the right person for the the time. And and the other is, I, I did mention that I saw myself. I had that opportunity to become county manager. I did. I never really had any regrets about it. Uh, you know, I, I can't think of a better manager to work with than than Russ Sable, who gave me a lot of independence. Uh, you know, he, he told me, he said, you know, there's some things I need you to do for this organization, but then you pick and choose your other projects. And that's how I became so involved in capital projects. Uh, as you probably know I'm a, I'm a woodworker, I'm a carpenter, I'm a stonemason, I'm an electrician, I'm a plumber. In fact, I spend most of my time volunteering now. I volunteer with nonprofits uh, and I volunteer through my church. We have a construction ministry I work on. We have a group called the Amen Handymen. We do projects for those in need, so yeah, you know, I, I hang doors and repair rotted wood and replace windows. Uh, I, I do custom work uh, in some of the homes, just trying to replicate some of the old molding. I do that in my shop. I have a, I have a full shop. Uh, I just finished a series of lamps uh, based on Taliesin, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, but I, I changed the design, not that I would ever disagree with Frank Lloyd Wright, but uh, he specified certain things uh, that I don't, you know, for, he, he mitered his corners. I used double through tenons. He used rice paper shades. I used mica because I just enjoy, my, enjoy working with mica. Uh, so I, I've just done, a, I think I just completed my eighth one. Uh, I finally got around to doing one for my desk. My wife calls me the, uh, like the cobbler that uh, makes shoes for everybody in town but doesn't have his own set of shoes or has worn out shoes, so I finally made a new lamp for my desk. And then I, since I made that one, I've started in, in uh, using Live Edge. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Live Edge, but you, you cut the trees vertically and it keeps the bark on them so they have a very organic look to them. So uh, I've started working a lot, a lot in Live Edge and I just made a Live Edge lamp. 
just finished that. And my wife told me this morning, she went to my desk and I put the lamp on my desk. Uh, we're going to take it up to North Carolina. And she says, Patrick, no more lamps, no more lamps. I don't know, I probably made 20 lamps. Well, it sounds like, <laughs> it sounds like your, your third retirement is... Definitely, is I promised her this time it would, it would, uh, I would stick to retirement. So uh, I'm trying to do as much as give back to the community. I know that sounds so cliche, but, but uh, give back to the community. And you know, this, this, this is our home. Even though we have a beautiful home up North Carolina, my father-in-law was an architect and designed the home. Uh, it's unique too. He went to uh, the University of Western Carolina in color. We had planted this sustainable forest to introduce a new species of wood into Western Carolina called the buckeye, you know, like the Ohio State buckeye. I always thought it was that acorn that ran around Brutus or whatever his name is. But uh, so he bought the, and had it all, he bought a good portion of the forest and had it all cut and milled and did the whole house in tongue and groove, buckeye and stone. So there's no drywall, nothing like that. And so when he passed away, my wife and I bought the, the, uh, the house from the trust, which basically all the other kids. But uh, yeah, so we enjoy the time up there. And yeah, we do spend about uh, a week to 10 days every month, but we call Savannah home and we're here most of the other time. Okay.